You're watching WBIN, the home of NH1 News. A storefront interactive display that works even when the store is closed. A craft brewery named for a Boston island that isn't really an island, but is finding success in the suburbs. How do you choose a name for your company? Pick one that's fun to say. But first, when the technology you're using is no longer the best out there, how do you fix that? This is the Language of Business look at Business Pivots, sponsored by the Center Cafe, the down-to-earth atmosphere of a family-run neighborhood hideaway with great food, hospitality, and conversation. Center Cafe at the train station in Needham Center. Here's Greg Stoller. In technology, pivots happen almost as often as the weather changes in New England. But after adjusting your strategy, that doesn't mean you'll encounter a blue sky and green lights. David Teplo is the CEO and founder of Integra Technology Consulting, and welcome to the Language of Business. Thank you, Greg. You've been in tech for 30 years. Tell us about the first company that you started in 1986. My first company was Database Technologies, which, as you say, I started in 1986. Uh, our focus was on Oracle technology and applications, which made us the very first consulting company on the East Coast to focus on that technology sector. And how did that move into Integra Technology Consulting? That company grew and evolved over 12 or 13 years. It was ultimately acquired in 1998. I stayed on for about a year and a half after the acquisition, decided it was time to move on for various reasons, uh, took a year off to honor a non-compete, and then decided it was time to get back in the game. So in 2000, I started Integra. How often do you see changes in technology? Almost monthly, but significant changes happen every five to 10 years, I would say. So if you're on the technology consulting side, how do you stay ahead of your clients? You just have to be aware of what's going on in the industry and, and try not to be just focused on what you know best, uh, but all, constantly be aware of what's going on outside your area of expertise. So do you consider this to be routine business strategy changes or classic pivoting? Probably more of the latter. Uh, okay. But it's something everybody should think about, I would say, in any industry. Is there any criteria you use to determine when a pivot is necessary? I think when you realize that an existing technology is no longer the best solution for a particular problem, you look for other technologies that solve that problem better. So I'm intrigued. Is the client coming to you saying we need to do a technology change, or have you pointed out for them? Usually it's us pointing out to them that they need to look at a different or alternative technology to solve a particular problem. Now, do their eyes roll back in their head because they figure you're just trying to upsell and charge for more services, or do they begrudgingly agree with you? They tend to agree with us because these are typically long-term relationships, trusting relationships, where they understand that we're doing this in their best interest, not necessarily ours. If you have to bring them through a pivot, do you charge separately for that, or is it all one considered routine fee? It tends to be a separate project, separate initiative, which is charged for separately. Do you ever get any feedback from them as to whether you gave them good guidance or not? Uh, we tend to maintain our relationships over the very long term, so I see, looking back, uh, months or years, hence, um, how things have worked out, make sure that things are working out well. If somebody wants to get into tech for the first time, what would be your advice to them in terms of strategic planning? Be hungry to learn what's new and what's different, and not just be focused on what you already know. You have 15 people you said that work for Integra Technology. How do you all keep apprised on what's happening day to day? I think we all do have that natural hunger for knowledge uh, and are fascinated by the changes that go on in our industry. Are you sponsoring roundtables? Are you giving the roundtables? How do you keep up on the latest and greatest? I encourage going to uh, conferences, uh, meetings, meetups, uh, and just to be constantly aware of what's going on in the press, reading up on new technologies. And we discuss that when we get together, and it's mostly something that people need to do on their own. You mentioned that of the 15 people you have working with you, that uh, a lot of them are client sites. How do you all keep in touch with each other during the workday? There's not a need to keep in regular touch, but um, I have regular lunches or coffees or drinks uh, with my people by going around to their sites where they are and uh, finding out how things are going. Uh, and usually at the same time talking to the client, making sure the client is happy with the way things are going. Have you had to do any pivots for Integra? Absolutely. Integra was a successor company to database technologies and originally in 2000 and for the first few years we were focused on a similar technology sector, that being the Oracle technology uh, and in some cases Oracle applications uh, section of the market. 
Uh, we had a big pivot uh, maybe five or six years ago when I realized that there were bigger problems and newer technologies, more interesting, more exciting things that companies were grappling with. Uh, this being a result of the whole big data phenomenon. And do you think you are unique in that space or do you have your own share of, of direct competitors? We certainly have some direct competitors, but not nearly as many as there were uh, in the Oracle technology sector. And is that because big data is just coming into its own these days, or do you have a unique competitive advantage? It is just coming into its own. I mean, so these technologies are still relatively new, and there's new ones coming around, uh, you know, every month or so. Uh, so it's really a question of, um, you know, these being brand new technologies and the expertise, therefore, being brand new. David, thank you. Thank you, Greg. David Teplow, CEO and founder of Integra Technology Consulting. Coming up, a brewery named for a Boston island that isn't really an island, but is finding success in the suburbs. How do you choose a name for your company? Pick one that's fun to say. But first, a storefront interactive display that works even when the store is closed. When the Language of Business Look at Business Pivots continues. You're watching the Language of Business look at business pivots. Once again, Greg Stuller. How does a brick and mortar business get customers even when they're not open? Oleg Viardro can help you with that. He is the CEO and co-founder of Image Surge, and welcome to the Language of Business. Thank you. What does Image Surge do? Well, our main product is the intelligent brick and mortar storefront. It's a technology that converts any ordinary storefront window display into a through the glass touch interactive experience. Are your products on the inside of the glass or the outside of the glass? So the product is behind the glass. And one of our propositions is that in two hours we'll take any storefront, any glass without any modification to the infrastructure and we'll convert that into a touch screen. So how then is somebody able to interact with it? By just touching the glass. So even though you have a glass pane that's the outside of a store and your products on the inside, you can actually have them interact with it. it, it regardless if it's one pane or two panes, it makes no difference. Uh, you can interact with the glass even after the store is closed. And is this patented technology? We have patents filed on, on double pane windows, which is very significant. 80% of all glass out there is double pane, low E, energy efficient glass. Uh, most of the new construction, 100% of new construction is double pane glass. So our big difference is that we can work with double pane glass. We don't have to replace windows ever. You mentioned while preparing for this interview, when I asked you what your most memorable pivot was, you said everyone pivots. Yeah. What do you mean by that? Well, I think that, I mean, any company company, uh, particularly a technology company, is always pivoting in some, in, in some respect, correct? Uh, whether it's uh, how you develop the product, whether it's your relationship with your employees, your partners, you always are, are adjusting to some degree, always changing direction to some degree. You have to do that to stay competitive. Now we uh, do a lot of pivoting when it comes to thinking about you know, the next features of the product. We have a platform that runs on the storefront. So we have to listen to our customers to really understand where do we go next? What's the next feature that's going to make sense? But how is that different than just old-fashioned product development? Well, it's how you define pivoting. And to me, it's like the running back that's, that's running down the field zigzagging to get to its goal. So I think it's about, it's very similar to product development, but I think it's listening more to, to the customer and reacting. And reacting, so it's listening and reacting, uh, as opposed to be, being in an insular kind of environment and making, uh, you know, scholastic decisions about how you're going to develop the product. Which do you think Image Surge does better, listening or reacting? Those two come together. Uh, those, those two come together, and you have to listen and you have to you know, distill all the information into what's relevant, um, and then you have to make a quick decision. You know, when a young company has the advantage of being able to make those decisions, sometimes a little bit better than maybe. Uh, uh, a larger company. Is the tail wagging the dog? Are the clients coming to you with changes or are you suggesting it to well, them? Well, I, I think it's a balance and many times, you know, your customers are, um, you know, they're busy. They're, they're busy with their regular business, right? So uh, you do deliver ideas, uh, concepts, and, and then you see what the reaction is and, and, and based on that you make certain decisions. Uh, and I'll give you an example. And, you know, one of our big industries is real estate. So in that particular situation, our customers are replacing paper displays that you typically see with an interactive experience where you can come up, you can search listings, and uh, you know, even when the store is closed, you can become a customer for a lead for that business. Well, one of the things that we discovered is that uh, real estate brokers also enjoy putting other types of content, sure. right? They like putting information uh, about an art show in the community. Uh, we have customers in Chicago that put up uh, uh, 
Cubs uh, congratulatory messaging after the Cubs won the World Series. And you know, talking to customers, we've learned that that's something they really love. It's a, it's a small little feature, but they love it. They love putting other content. So you know, based on that, there was a little bit of a pivot in terms of where we allocate our resources in product development. When you go through your pivots, how patient are your investors? I think you know, there's a rationale behind it, and there's a history of good decision making. They, be, they, they tend to be more patient. <laughs> And how about your customers? If they had purchased version 2.0 of your product and you're now in version 3 or 4.0, what do you do with your legacy customers? We update every customer with new features. So it's, it's an ongoing platform that gets updated on a regular basis. So everybody's on the same page. Everybody gets the benefit of the latest features. Oleg, thank you. Thank you. Oleg Viadro, CEO and founder of Image Surge. Still ahead, how do you choose a name for your company? Pick one that's fun to say. But first, a craft brewery named for a Boston island that isn't really an island, but is finding success in the suburbs. On the Language of Business, look at business pivots. Learning on somebody else's dime gives you good experience in starting a company, but does it allow you to get through a business pivot more easily? Maybe yes, maybe no. Let's ask that question to Adam Romano. He is president and founder of Castle Island Brewing Company, and welcome to Language of Business. Thank you. You had prior experience in brewing before you started Castle Island. How did that help you? I kind of did my own personal pivot and was in consulting and ended up working for a brewery up in New Hampshire really for fun. Ended up falling in love with it and decided I wanted to start my own brewery someday. Um, How many beers did you have in you when you made that decision, by the way? <laughs> Somewhere between one and I can't remember. <laughs> My experience at that company was unique in a lot of ways. I was there when the company transitioned from a really small system to a larger system and then from that large system in one location to a large system on the other side of the street. And I got to really experience what it's like to watch a brewery go through not one but two massive growth transitions. Uh, and in a big way that influenced my business plan for Castle Island in thinking about the runway I wanted to build in up front so we didn't face the same kind of disruptive challenges when we opened. Did it work? It did, but we've been in business for 10 months, so there's not a whole lot of data to pull from right now. We did sign a 10-year lease in a space that's probably bigger than we initially planned on, but it gives us a lot of room to expand in a pretty turnkey manner. You're in the middle of a suburb running a craft brewery. What's the joke line? <laughs> Brewed in Norwood and inspired by <laughs> Castle Island. Um, it, we looked for space in South Boston for a couple years. As is no surprise to many people in the Boston area, we didn't really find anything. Shocking. Even, even if we had, affordability would have been a totally different ball of wax. Uh, using a broker, we found this terrific space down in Norwood, which actually ended up being a blessing in disguise. It's a very easy place to do business. The town is an absolute gem to work with and our local fans are super supportive. What is the origin of the Castle Island name? Well, I actually live in Selfie, about a block away from Castle Island. It's my favorite place in the city. You can find me out there with my dog most mornings. So it's a special place to me, uh, and I figured it'd make a pretty good name for a brewery as well. How would you describe the beer? Is it premium, is it lager, or something else? Local craft beer is kind of the most widely understood category that we fall into today. Um, we have two flagship beers. Candlepin, named after the New England classic, is a hoppy session ale. It's light, great hop flavor, but very easy to drink. I like to describe it as the ultimate lawnmower beer. Uh, everyone loves IPAs today. Keeper is very balanced. It's very smooth. It's very drinkable. Uh, we actually get a lot of people saying they don't like IPAs, but they love Keeper. How much beer are you making and where are you selling it? So right now, this year, we're trending to do about uh, 4,000 barrels of beer, uh, which is somewhere around 50,000 cases in total. And we're selling it almost all across the state of Massachusetts. We have about 800 retail locations right now carrying the beer uh, everywhere east of Amherst and we'll be w making our way out to Western Mass sometime in 2017. Given that you're only 10 months in, what do you foresee as a possible business pivot? We're actually already in the middle of one, believe it or not. We really built our business to be distribution based. Uh, we signed on with a distribution partner day one. 99% of our beer goes out the back door on trucks, not out the front door in bags. But we're already seeing some uh, pull from the market to add the latter component. So we are putting in a tap room. Uh, it's going to be opening spring 2017, where people will be able to come down to the brewery and actually have a pint on site in the building where the beer was made interact with the brewers, interact with the staff in a different way, um, and not shift away from the wholesale business, which is still our bread and butter, but add a nice component to it to really kind of give people the at home and at the brewery experience that they're looking for. How does the fact that Castle Island doesn't only make beer help with your business strategy? It really comes down to branding. People love going to a brewery, taking a tour, trying the beer, and then going home with a shirt or a glass or a hat. 
Um, for us, it's a great way to build the, build the brand. It's an awesome opportunity if someone's out at the bar wearing a Castle Island shirt. So it's really a nice way for us to continue to build our brand when we can't be physically present. Are those items lost leaders or do they make money as well? We're not making, you know, we're not getting rich off them. We're not losing money off them. Um, it's pretty much just, you know, paid marketing as we view it. What do you think your biggest competitive advantage is besides taste and price? Certainly the wholesale distribution model is part of it. Um, there are not a lot of breweries in the state that are set to scale quickly and efficiently, um, which can be a good thing if your model is to retail beer, but given ours is to wholesale beer, the fact that we've built in plenty of, plenty of runway with strong financial backing and good distribution partners from day one means that we can reasonably and affordably put beer on the shelf at the local package store, at someone's grocery store near their house um, consistently and it's going to be high quality still. Would you ever consider entering into an OEM type arrangement even though it's not computers but beer? We love brewing too much to give someone else the reins. We like to be in control of our destiny, not just the scheduling but also the actual production. It's something that, you know, for the right fit at the right time we might consider, but in the long run no, that won't be a primary strategy. How do you take over the market? Is it varying price points? Is it varying flavors or something else entirely? It's all of the above. Um, you've got to constantly be innovating and coming up with new beers to keep today's consumer excited because it seems like the average consumer these days constantly wants something new. At the same rate, you have to produce high quality standbys that people can reliably go to the, the grocery store and pick up when they're heading to a barbecue because they know the beer's great, they know it's fresh, they know it's local, and they know it's affordable. Adam, thank you. Thank you. Adam Romano, president and founder of Castle Island Brewing Company. Coming up, how do you choose a name for your company? Pick one that's fun to say when the Language of Business look at business pivots continues. You're watching the Language of Business look at business pivots. Once again, Craig Stoller. They say necessity is the mother of invention, but does that also include teaching yourself how to sell? Scott Hunter is CEO and founder of VitaVu, and welcome to the Language of Business. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So what does VitaVu mean? So VitaVu, I think, was the most fun word to say, have the options available for my then two-year-old son, but uh, it's derived from a state park in my home state of Wyoming, a place where hiking, climbing, backpacking, fly fishing is a uh, part of life, so to speak, and a good fit for our brand. We are not in Wyoming currently. How did you get from there to here? I moved from Wyoming to this area to attend Babson College and proceed um, with my MBA through that program because of the entrepreneurship focus and the, and the unbelievable leadership in that field that Babson provided. Um, it was a kind of a no-brainer case as far as moving. As much as I hated to leave the West, I, I'm very thankful that I was able to come to Babson. What was your inspiration to start the company? I had been a big outdoorsman and appreciated the outdoors, hiking and climbing and otherwise, originally starting through the Boy Scouts and obviously as a factor of where I lived. And uh, as I got into it, I, I started developing a real appreciation for the gear, all the little trinkets. But as I got further into that, some of the backpacks and bags that I had used that had been handed down from my father and grandfather, the American-made quality, you couldn't replicate anymore. A lot of the things that I was available to buy were made in China or made overseas in other places and unfortunately the quality just wasn't there. So when I set out to, to start this business, the goal was, was to bring back manufacturing to the United States and find a way to make that work, uh, to return that same level of quality back to uh, an area that needed it, in my eyes. And was this immediately post-MBA or a few years after the fact? So this was immediately post. I actually came to Babson with this business model in mind and uh, continued to develop it through their entrepreneurship intensity track there and then launched out of graduation. And why did you have to teach yourself how to sell? I know the nature of pivoting is, is being able to recognize faults and challenges that you faced and find new ways to be able to find success. And for me, I started with the traditional route, uh, partially designed, or predicated based on my investors and what they were telling me to do and advisors and what they were telling me to do and uh, the little voices in the back of my head trying to go with traditional manufacturing, wherever that may have been. And through that process, I, I had a lot of very expensive lessons. And in short, ended up finding myself down to $700 in the bank. Uh, the company was basically bankrupt and, and on the verge of folding up shop. And, and what uh, did you start with in terms of your bank balance? Uh, bank balance was significantly higher okay. than that. I'll leave it at that. Uh, I mean, we were, we were in the five-figure range, but, okay. but nothing crazy. But right. nonetheless, the, the effort of trying to coordinate manufacturing and sourcing and back and forth with teams from designers and, and all these third parties uh, vacuumed up what cash I did have. Sure. Unfortunately, I was at this point where I didn't have the resources to continue, uh, but I also had nothing to show for the effort put in so far. So I ended up having a wonderful conversation with Yvonne Chenard, the manufacturer, 
founded Patagonia, sure. yeah, yeah. and uh, another one with a gentleman who founded Gregory Packs, Wayne Gregory, and they both basically said the same thing, which is, look, if you, if you can't build something with your own hands, you don't know what goes into making it. So when you ask somebody to put a zipper in here, is that, is that really tangible? Can you do that? Or are you asking them to do something that's, that's not realistic? And so, in short, they said, you know, go out and buy a sewing machine and teach yourself to sew. And so I did. I love it. And the pivot was not teaching yourself how to sew, but bringing manufacturing back home? Bringing manufacturing back home is definitely the big part of the pivot. So I, I, going with the outside sources and otherwise became impossible. And being able to bring it back in-house, learn those methods, allowed me to establish this baseline where we could build to order. A uh, business model that we still employ today, seven years later, where we, in effect, take an order in, we hand cut, hand build, and hand ship each individual piece to meet the needs of the individual customer. What is the best thing about bringing your manufacturing home? Having the families that support the production of my goods, being able to, to see the impact on those individual families has had an unbelievable impact on me too. I know that every unit that's produced, I'm paying someone that has kids or a husband or a family that they need to support, and I'm investing in local communities again. And that means more to me than being able to outsource and, and get a cheaper rate per se, uh, being able to, to do it the right way instead of necessarily the easiest way. But do your customers really care? My customers definitely do, and we have a lot of folks that come specifically to us because of that American-made aspect. I mean, the, the thread, the buckles, the zippers, the webbing, the fabric itself, that's all American-made, but, but when it's handcrafted by individuals that are, that are real people um, in your community, it, it makes a big difference. Are you worried about scalability? Every day. <laughs> but the reality is, is as we've grown, the concerns that I've had the day before always seem to be uh, met by the needs of what I am able to produce as we move forward. As I went through the process, the thing that I think I learned most and that was most valuable to me was the opportunity to learn the ins and outs of the business that I was getting into before I dove in. And had I had that, that mindset early, I don't think I would have gone through that early, you know, beating my head against the wall uh, process that I ultimately did did, but rather get right to the point and be able to start working from that American-made focus early as I initially intended up front. Scott, thank you. Thank you, sir. Scott Hunter, CEO and founder of VitaVu. Thanks for watching The Language of Business, sponsored by the Center Cafe, the down-to-earth atmosphere of a family-run neighborhood hideaway with great food, hospitality, and conversation. Center Cafe at the train station in Needham Center. To join the discussion, go to languageofbusiness.biz.